because um, nine years ago, when wild fermentation first came out, um, Malaprops was the first bookstore in the United States and invited me to uh, come and talk about my book. So um, I just feel this uh, extraordinary loyalty to this beautiful store um, and to independent bookstores in general, and it's just nice to see one that is thriving with this. Um, so thank you, Malaprops, and thank you all for supporting Malaprops. Um, I'm going to try to talk for a very short time um, so that we can have um, uh, uh, more interaction. And uh, I guess one thing I want to address is, you know, what makes this different from wild fermentation and what made me decide to write another book about fermentation. Um, and really, like, you know, a, a book is like a little time capsule. You know, it's like, you know, 2001, uh, you know, I, I, I had, uh, you know, almost I had like eight years of fermentation experience behind me. I was really excited to share it. I wrote Wild Fermentation. Um, and, and basically, you know, since then I've had, uh, you know, 10 more years of experience fermenting. But more important than that, uh, Wild Fermentation opened doors for me to have the opportunity to talk to lots and lots of people about fermentation. And it caused me to put a website up. Um, and through that website, I've answered about 5,000 troubleshooting questions from people who were uh, um, uh, doing fermentation themselves at home. And through that process of, you know, just hearing people's stories about fermentation, hearing people's memories of what, what they remember their grandparents doing, hearing people's memories of you know, ferments uh, you know, from the old country that they were trying to figure out how to recreate. Um, you know, hearing what obstacles people came up against when they were fermenting, what, uh, you know, what unexpected results made them feel afraid or insecure, um, you know, forced me to do all this research and, and, and just, you know, find out about more aspects of it. Um, and so, I don't know, there was just a certain moment a few years ago when I realized it was time for me to, uh, you know, write a more in-depth book about fermentation, and that's what this book is, and I hope that um, you know, I, I hope that while fermentation will continue to, to uh, um, uh, you know, have a life of its own because, you know, perhaps that's a more um, accessible, uh, you know, introduction for someone who is just, um, um, you know, experimenting with fermentation for the first time. Um, but, you know, I would think for, you know, people who develop a, a deepening interest in, in the topic that, that, that um, the art of fermentation um, you know, just is, is more, more thorough. I, I, it certainly is not comprehensive. I mean, if there's one thing that I have learned through my explorations of fermentation is that, you know, this realm is infinite. Um, uh, you know, there, 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 there's no way that, you know, in one lifetime, you know, any one individual could, um, you know, learn everything there is to know about fermentation. You know, that there are, you know, bakers who spend their lives, um, you know, sort of refining the, 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 the art of baking bread. There are brewers who devote their lives to, um, um, you know, sort of learning about brewing. I mean, the, the realm of fermentation is, you know, just unbelievably vast. Um, now, one current event that I think, you know, fermentation r really relates closely to is, um, you know, the release about a month ago of the first report of the Human Microbiome Project. Um, you know, and, 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 and basically, you know, when, uh, you know in, in the 90s, when they first, you know, mapped out the, the, the human genome, um, you know, there was, there was this acknowledgement on the part of the um, um, geneticists who were working on it that, well, you know, the, the, the cells that reflect our, you know, our unique individual DNA, you know, only are telling us a small part of the story because those cells are outnumbered in our bodies at least 10 to 1 by bacteria that we are host to. You know, or maybe it's not that we are host to them. You know, maybe they are hosts to us. And um, you know, in a certain regard, we are these you know, bacterial superstructures. Um, and it's not only us. You know, it's 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 all other life. I mean, the the um, you know best explanation you know thus far of you know the origins of evolution is that all life has evolved from bacteria. So you know, plants are evolved from bacteria, fungi are evolved from bacteria, animals and human beings are, are evolved from bacteria. And, you know, that's what made, you know, so, so no other form of life has ever lived without bacteria. It's just, it's just bacteria are, are part of everything. And they're, they're part of our functionality. You know, 
Human beings could not reproduce without bacteria. You know, we couldn't digest food or assimilate nutrients without bacteria. And it's becoming more and more evident that bacteria play a huge role in um, what we call our immune function. I mean, just this year, there was research that found that when you have an infection in your lung, and your body uh, uh, mounts a response to that, and um, you know, uh, isolates that infection and gets rid of it for you, that it's actually bacteria in our gut that mediate that immune response. So you know, bacteria are you know, very, uh, um, very integral to the functioning of all uh, you know, um, um, uh, biological entities. Um, but the corollary to this is that the food that we eat is also uh, you know, host to all these different bacteria. And so, you know, once human beings got into the idea of storing food, we were dealing with not only the food, but the bacteria on the food. So there's this sort of, you know, inevitability to fermentation. This is why it's found all over the world. Um, uh, you know, it, it's just it, it, the bacteria are there and they're gonna do something to the food. You know, I, I, I define fermentation pretty broadly as, as the transformative action of microorganisms, but you know, obviously not all the transformative action of microorganisms results in delicious things that we wanna put into our mouths. <laughs> you know, almost all of the food that we discard, we discard precisely because of the transformative action of microorganisms. So, you know, there's this, um, you know, imperative to you know figure out how to work with these microorganisms, which people figured out before they understood that they were microorganisms. It was just sort of the dynamics of how different foods um, under different types of environmental conditions would, would age. And really, the fermentation arts are these like you know, subtle manipulations of environmental conditions to encourage the growth of you know some kind of organism rather than some other kind of organism uh, that, that, that that's present on. Um, for the most part, it is very simple. Um, you know, we all, I don't want to say, I don't want to generalize all of us, you know, most of us, um, you know, almost everyone who is, you know, raised in our time and our place um, is indoctrinated into this idea that bacteria are dangerous. Uh, our lives would be better if we could eradicate all of the bacteria. You know, lots of products are marketed on, 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 on that premise. You know, you go to the store to buy some soap, and um, you know, half of the soaps are, are advertised as you know, kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria, and there's really nothing sexier you could write on a container of soap. Um, but you know, I, I would hope that um, you know the, the, the findings of the Human Microbiome Project and, and the repercussions of that, um, you know, in coming years, will help to um, you know shift our worldview and um, you know help help us to. Embrace bacteria rather than trying to um, er eradicate them, and you know, and not, you know, not that I necessarily think that just eating food with living bacteria, you know, is 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 a sort of easy or instant way for us to sort of you know completely <clears throat> regain whatever uh, you know complex bacterial communities uh, you know might be being lost as a result of all of the chemical exposure that we that, that we all have in our daily lives. You know, however, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, consciously ingesting bacteria that are parts of the foods that we love and that are parts of the, um, you know, cultural legacies uh, that, that we have received from, from our ancestors is one of the ways that we can, uh, you know, invite bacteria into our bodies, that we can, you know, replenish and diversify um, that bacterial populations. Um, and it's uh, it's very gratifying for me to see uh, you know, this this level of uh, interest in all this. Um, so anyway, I want to make one announcement, and then I just want to open it up to talk about whatever you all want to talk about. Um, so uh, uh, Liat, are you here? Could you? Uh, okay. So Liat here is teaching a miso workshop on yeah. Sunday, July 29th, <laughs> uh, here in Asheville, Sunday afternoon. So you have flyers and information, and if uh, if anyone's interested in learning how to make miso. Are you going to teach them how to make koji also? Yeah, we're going to make koji from scratch and miso. It's all organic. We're not using soybeans. So come see me if you're interested. I still have 10 spots. And, you know, if you've never thought that you could fall in love with a bowl, meet koji. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so does anyone have anything they want to talk about? Any, uh, you know, uh, questions about the mold on your sauerkraut or more profound topics? <laughs>
down and you're just like, ooh, ooh. Oh, that is such a hard question. I mean, I am very, very devoted to sauerkraut. I mean, I love sauerkraut. And by sauerkraut, I mean fermented vegetables. I mean, you know, pickles are what got me interested in fermentation. You know, I grew up in New York City, and, you know, the pickles that people outside of New York City know as kosher dills, but New York City would just call them sour pickles. Um, or half sour pickles. Um, you know, that's what got me interested in fermentation. I love sauerkraut. This summer I made a batch of it. With this woman, April McGregor, in, uh, in, in, in Carborough, um, uh, told me about like, a Cherokee tradition of fermented corn. And I've been sort of you know, using that and playing with it and making these like corn relishes, fermented corn relishes, and they're so good. But I mean, you know, I love yogurt. I love Beer. I make I make savory, cheesy sourdough pancakes all the time. I love that as just a you know like a like a generic um, you know food that can incorporate almost anything. Um, you now I love to make miso. I love tempeh. I love natto. I really I've, I, I've developed a taste for natto, which is this you know sort of notorious uh, alkaline, ammonia smelling, slimy food. It's really totally delicious. Uh, <laughs> So, I don't know, I mean, I, I, oh, did I forget to tell you that I love beer? Um, so, and, um, and here I am, enjoying a, enjoying a local bottle of kombucha. Um, so, I don't, I don't really have favorites, I love them. <laughs> Speaking of uh, kombucha, I'm actually brewing my first batch, and someone handed, handed it over to me, but, you know, I'm reading about this, and I'm reading, you know, I haven't read your books, but uh, I'm reading about this, and reading, you know, you have to keep everything really sterile, and, Stuff and, and there's also this idea out there that fermentation sort of kills all the bad bacteria. But then when you read about you know stories like the the tempeh that we had that uh, got contaminated here in town, just, just different things like that, it sort of makes you wonder like okay, but fermentation sort of. Part, and I, I know tempeh is not fermented either. So, well, tempeh is fermented. Is it okay? So yeah, you just uh, you know in, in my mind I'm thinking fermentation is killing all that stuff or you know killing the bacteria that make you bad or you know, how do you, how do you work with the ster sterile environment? Okay. Well, first of all, let me say that like I, I don't sterilize things in my practice. I mean, I think that I think sterility really is, is a myth. I mean, there's certain things, you know, culturing pure mold spores. If you wanna, um, if you wanna make your own tempeh starter in the American style of working with a single mold, Rhizopus uh, oligosporus, you you need a certain amount of sterility. Otherwise, each generation you're gonna it's gonna be it's gonna be less. Of what, of, of what it is you're trying to create. But in general, um, you know, the, the, the principles of fermentation are, are, are all about, you know, sort of critical mass ideas. You know, in, in something like sauerkraut, it's just that there's like so much of the indigenous lactic acid bacteria on all vegetables that if you get them in the correct environment, submerged under liquid that's a little bit salty, the, lac the lactic acid bacteria are gonna flourish every, every time. And, um, um, you know, basically, like there, there's no history of food poisoning in relation to this food because it's intrinsically safe because of the acidification that that, that, that occurs. Um, uh, you know, when you're making kombucha, one of the important ways of creating a selective environment to keep it um, safe is you add a little bit of mature kombucha into your fresh sweet tea along with the kombucha mother, and that acidification limits what can grow. Um, yeah, tempeh is a little bit of a different story. I mean, it's hard to generalize, you know, with any one statement about all fermented foods. Um, one of the things about tempeh is it is not an acidic fermentation. And one of the things that makes acidified foods so safe is that none of the food poisoning organisms that people worry about can grow in an acidic environment. Um, uh, you know, so for instance, you know, let's take botulism. That's why botulism is associated with canning of non-acid foods. But but it, but it's not a concern when you're talking about uh, you know canning of, of, of acid foods. Like it's the acid that protects against uh, uh, botulism, uh, uh, E. coli, um, uh, salmonella. Um, you know, like the, the the major food poisoning organisms. So um, you know. In general, you don't need to worry too much about safety. If you want to get into fermenting meat and fish, there's a lot more, you know, kind of parameters for, for safety and potential for danger. I mean, the word botulism comes from Latin botulus, which means sausage. 
Um, and so you know, until, until the invention of canning, which was in the 1900s, um, you know, botulism was this obscure food poisoning disease associated with sausages. So you know, just di different fermented foods have different parameters for, um, for, for, for safety. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think that it, as long as you you know have a basic understanding of those parameters, I mean, none of this is rocket science. None of this has been done in laboratories. These are all things that you know just have been done in people's in people's homes and people's communities. And you know, as long as you have a basic understanding of the um, selective environment you're trying to create, it's not it's not really um, you know, dangerous or or Russian roulette or anything like that. Well, that's the same thing as just, just add, I mean, you know, many people would consider kombucha to be immature vinegar. Um, so, you know, that, that's what adding mature kombucha, you know, to it, you know, yeah, sure, if you don't have kombucha, you could add vinegar. Same, same thing. Um, you kind of just alluded to it a little bit. Could you talk some about what Getting a you know getting a mixed culture. Okay, let, let me just say something about uh, you know my pure cultures are a human invention of the last you know 100 150 years. You know a little packet of yeast you can buy in every supermarket. You know that is not something that exists in the natural world. That's something that you know we we have created the the, the idea of you know isolating individual types of organisms and. Um, um, uh, uh, propagating them as, as individual things. Um, so, you know, all of the tempeh that's available in the United States is made from, um, uh, you know, a, a single strain of Rhizopus oligosporus that actually is maintained by the USDA in a culture library that, 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 that they maintain. Um, and, um, you know, I would say the most technically um, uh, challenging uh, fermentation project that I have ever undertaken is propagating um, uh, these tempeh, excuse me, spores. Um, and I mean, I describe in the art of fermentation, you know, how I did it and what, you know, what the challenges are. This winter, I got invited to teach in, uh, in Indonesia. And I had like this wonderful adventure uh, uh, in Indonesia. And my hosts, um, you know, took me to a, a village where they knew someone who was involved in tempeh production. And the starter that they used in this village was um, uh, basically what they would do is, is, is take inoculated soybeans, maybe a half a dozen soybeans, and put them between two leaves of this particular tree, waru, it's a, a, a hibiscus family tree, and they would let it over ripen until it sporulates and then they dried the leaves. And they just had a shoebox full of leaves <laughs> like that. And what they did is they, they, they tore it apart, you see spore, black spores, uh, black and yellow spores, indicating that it's a mixed uh, fungal community. Um, uh, pure, like the, 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 the American style tempeh would only have black spores. Um, in China, 2,000 years ago, they started distinguishing between yellow-robed mold and white-robed mold. And so rhizopus would be a white-robed mold. Um, so they took half of a leaf for 50 kilos, 110 pounds of soybeans. And in one hand, he had, he had the, the leaf, and in the other hand, he just picked up a handful of soybeans and went like this. Picked up another hand, and you know, he did this for like 10 minutes. Um, and um, and, and, and it, it was simple to propagate. There was no, there, I assure you, there was nothing sterile in that. <laughs> and there's nothing sterile in any of our kitchens, and there's no reason to aspire to, to, to be sterile. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, it's important to work with clean hands and clean tools. The biggest thing I'm concerned about is, is soap residue. Um, um, so, you know, you want to rinse things really well. Um, you know, I like to use hot water to rinse things, but you know, it's not like there's nothing in the environment that we're keeping them in that's, that, that, that's sterile, so we don't have to worry about sterility. I don't know where, you know, short of going to Indonesia and finding a village where they're producing tempeh and, um, you know, smuggling some of those leaves in, um, you know, which is what I did. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, this, this summer, actually, I've, I've been experimenting with different leaves, and the, the, be the best results I've had uh, have been with grape leaves. Um, you know, sandwiching some inoculated soybeans between grape leaves, letting them over ripen, and then using those leaves as the starter for for uh, uh, another batch. Um, yeah. Thank you. So, what are some of your techniques to keep consistency over different, say, different generations of a particular, you know, fermentation? Well, okay. So
so this is the, the like the, the, the very, okay, so well, I'm going to talk about yogurt for a minute, okay, because, you know, yogurt is something that I've been making, or I really started making yogurt before I specifically got interested in fermentation, um, and, uh, and, you know, when, when I, when I want to make yogurt, I, I, I used to go to the store, I'd buy some, you know, plain whole milk yogurt, Dannon, Snowy Pill, whatever, um, and then I'd come home and you know, I'd heat up my milk, I'd cool it down to 110 degrees, I'd set up some sort of an incubator space, I'd, I'd introduce my yogurt into the milk, I'd put the jars into the incubator, you know, leave it for, you know, four to eight hours or something and, and, and have yogurt. But then if I, if, if I would make another batch of yogurt from that, it wouldn't be as thick. And after I did like, you know, the three or four generations, it stopped having the characteristics of yogurt. And it was always this perplexing question for me. You know, how could this food have been made in continuous tradition if it doesn't maintain its nice yogurty consistency? And what I finally figured out, um, you know, after talking to some microbiologists about it, um, and, uh, and, and, and Betty Steckmeyer, who has been a, a mentor for me, who is the person who started a, a company called Gem Cultures, um, that, that sells food cultures, is that the commercial yogurts are, are made from isolated organisms, um, whereas heirloom yogurt cultures, traditional yogurt cultures, are basically evolved communities of microorganisms that have evolved community dynamics to maintain themselves and to um, uh, defend themselves you know, against the random other bacteria um, as well as against um, bacteriophages and you know a, a, a other you know sort of um, you know, forms of life that can attack uh, that bacteria. So um, so I finally got a hold of on the internet you know from a company called CulturesForHealth.com a um, an heirloom yogurt culture. I actually bought two. I bought one from Bulgaria and one from Greece. Um, and uh, I, I I actually. I accidentally ate all of the Greek one after a few generations, but I, I, mean, I, still, have, I still have my Bulgarian one going. I, I estimate that it's been 50 generations, um, and every batch is you know just as you know, thick and beautiful as the last batch. So you know th this sort of illustrates that, like a concept that like these traditional uh, you know ferments are basically these evolved communities that maintain themselves. Um, you know, they can be propagated by generalists. Uh, you know, basically at the Pasteur Institute at the beginning of the 20th century, you know, they looked at yogurt under the microscope. Oh my God, there's so many different kinds of organisms. This is confusing. Most of these must be extraneous. We're gonna like pick out the, you know, we're gonna isolate the, um, you know, the active compounds. It's, it's just like what we see in botanical medicine where, you know, it can't be that the whole plant is the medicine. We have to isolate the specific compounds that are responsible. And so, you know, we're always like fragmenting things and taking things out of them. So, so yogurt is now defined by, you know, US law and by the Codex Alimentarius as, as, as containing two specific bacteria, Lactobacillus bulgaricus and Streptococcus thermophilus, and then manufacturers can add in other ones. And some of them add in Lactobacillus uh, acidophilus, some of them add in bifidus, some of you know, the Activia one adds some other you know, proprietary probiotic. Um, but, but it's defined by two organisms. Traditional ones were these, were these um, um, uh, you know, communities. I mean, kefir also is a, it, it's a community, a really elaborate community. It's, uh, you know, no, no, no fewer than 30 organisms. And there have been lots of attempts, in, and, and what, kefir is, is a scoby, a symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast. It looks like little florets of cauliflower or something. There's these little rubbery blobs that grow in the milk. But there have been a number of attempts in laboratories to take as many of these isolated organisms as possible and try to make them become, you know, one of these, a, a scoby, a kefir grain, and nobody can do it. I mean, you know, kefir grains beget kefir grains the way elephants beget elephants, and, and you know, they're, they're just, they're evolved forms of life. And most of, you know, most of the fermentation starters, like, you know, tempeh, um, um, you know, you could think of a sourdough this way. The sourdoughs exhibit much less um, uh, stability. I mean, sourdoughs really become what you feed them. Um, 
but 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 you know most of the fermentation organisms are are, are communities. Um, you know through some kind of continuous practice, uh, you know establish themselves in a in a way that that becomes consistent. Your follow up question. You're saying closer, the closer it is to almost a lambic file or lambic the origin of the bacteria, the closer and more stable the bacteria will be. Well, I'm not. I, I mean, I'm not sure what you mean by the lambic. You know, I mean free range. Yeah, but I mean something like yogurt. I mean, it's like it's coming from the yogurt. Like you know, you could take a yogurt from Bulgaria and keep on feeding it, uh, uh, you know, milk here, and it, it's maintaining its it's maintaining its um, its integrity as a community of, 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 of bacteria in a way that two isolated organisms never can. Sandra, when speaking of milk ferments, when you're doing ferments, especially with raw milk. Do you ever find it necessary to bring it to more than body temperature? Well, if you want to make thick yogurt, you have to. You have to. You have. To. I mean, basically, like what uh, um, um, uh, the way that milk changes from a liquid to a solid requires denaturing of proteins by heat. So the same thing that you know Sally Fallon and other raw milk and I, I mean I am totally a raw milk advocate. I love to drink raw milk, but I mean I did notice in my attempts to make raw milk yogurt that like they were always really really runny. Like what makes yogurt solid is the denaturing of proteins. In your experience, if you get a batch of yogurt that you really like. Do you ever try to put some of it in the freezer to suspend it and then use it again so that you can recreate the same consistency of yogurt? Have you tried that before? Because um, I've, I've heard of people doing that and having success of having that consistency of the same batch as far yeah, as... Yeah, I just don't see why you need to put it in the freezer. I mean, you know, just... I mean, I, I just you don't mind like the fridge. And sometimes, like, sometimes I'll go for, you know, three months between batches and just I go to the bottom of the jar. I don't take the stuff at the top that w that's been exposed to air that starts to get a really yeasty smell and flavor. I, like, I skim that away and I go to the bottom of the jar. Um, I mean, the problem with freezing things um, is that, um, you know, bacterial cells can burst in the, in, you know, just because of the expansion and contraction of water that happens in the, in the freezing and thawing. So, I mean, people do freeze certain kinds of, of, of ferments, and it doesn't necessarily kill all of the bacteria, but you definitely um, uh, get a reduction of you know, potency and cell viability uh, with each freezing and thawing. Um, you know, one, one thing that bakers sometimes do, you know, a lot of, a lot of bakers, uh, you know, they, they think of putting a little sourdough in the freezer as like backing it up in case, uh, you know, someone accidentally throws away their starter. Um, but it really, the, the more you can make it solid, the, 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 the better you'll maintain the viability. Um, and a lot of the stories that I've heard about, um, well, to, just because there's less expand, you know, the less water content there is, the less expansion and contraction you get. So you could take the same sourdough and have it in a liquid state, or add more flour to it and make it in a more solid state. With yogurt, you can't necessarily do that the same way. Um, when people freeze kefir grains, what they do is they typically like dry it with a towel and then sprinkle powdered milk on it to sort of thicken it up a little bit before they. Um, do it. But with yogurt, people sometimes dry them. Like in most of the stories that I've heard of like migration with the yogurt starter, you know, it's basically people taking like a handkerchief, putting it in the yogurt, and then drying that, rolling that up, putting that in their luggage. And then when they when they establish themselves in their new home, they um, you know use use the corner of the handkerchief in some you know, essential to, to start it. So I mean I would think like drying might be a, a more effective way than freezing, but but I don't really have I mean, and when I say sauerkraut, I mean fermented vegetables. It doesn't have to just be cabbage. Um, you know, I mean, any kind of vegetables that, that you have an abundance of, you, 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 can, you can follow basically the same um, um, process. But, 
I mean, first of all, you don't need any special equipment. You don't need any special cultures. You don't need a starter. It's relatively quick. Um, you know, you, you could see results in less than a week. Um, you know, it's incredibly delicious and versatile. I, I don't know. I mean, I just feel like it, you know, it just makes the most sense to me as a, as, as a first fermentation experience. It's just, it's intrinsically safe. Um, and, um, and, you know, it's wonderful. I mean, and, and then that's what got me all, you know, hooked in all this. Um, but, you know, really, I, I mean, I, I would also say whatever it is you really, really like. Uh, you know, I mean, some people would be much more motivated by beer, for instance, than by sauerkraut. Um, <laughs> but, you know, beer, you need a bunch of special equipment. And, you know, for, like, my interest in fermentation is really like, you know, starting from raw ingredients and, you know, turning it into the food that I want to do. Like, I have only met a couple of people ever in my life who did that with beer. Um, you know, I, I'm, you know, very few people are like malting their own grains and, you know, just do, do, doing the whole thing. Um, but, um, um, you know, sauerkraut, you're just starting with vegetables, turning it into a finished product. Well, what is, so often like I try to make dill pickles using fermentation, but they get soggy instead of crisp. What did I do wrong? Well, okay, so for fermenting um, uh, cucumbers, are, it's one of the most challenging uh, vegetables you could ferment. And a part of it is their, their wateriness, you know, their, their, their watery nature, um, um, you know, makes, uh, okay, uh, what makes vegetables crunchy, crispy, are compounds called pectins. All vegetables, as all biological Creations contain enzymes to digest themselves. So vegetables contain enzymes that are called pectinase enzymes that digest the pectin. And any fermented vegetable, given enough time or warm enough temperatures or little salt, will get mushy eventually. Um, I have a batch of radish kraut that I made in November, and I have been, eat you know, I got to the end of the barrel, um, and I've, 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 I've been eating the, the bottom of the barrel, and now, after, you know, several weeks of 100 degree temperatures, suddenly it's like baby food. Uh, it's just like mushy, and that's when I throw it into the compost. It happens faster with cucumbers. One of the things about cucumbers is that they ripen when the temperatures are highest. In, uh, you know, in contrast with cabbages, um, well, I mean, in the South we have like you know our, our, our spring cabbages and our fall cabbages, but in certainly in more nor more northern climates, you know, cabbages are ready in the fall when it's getting cold. Um, so you know, any ferment that you make in the fall when it's getting cold will stay crispy for a much longer period of time than something that you make in the heat of the summer. Um, a couple of tricks for keeping your cucumbers uh, crunchy is, well, leaves. Uh, using, um, you know, grape leaves or oak leaves, but also thyme. I mean, you know, when the temperatures are as hot as it's been, just ferment it for like three or four days. I just ferment it until it starts, the, the color changes from bright green to like an olive green, and then I just get it right in the refrigerator um, before it has a chance to, uh, uh, to, to, to get soft. But, um, you know, unless you can control the temperature and do it in an environment in the 60s, um, it's, it's just fermenting cucumbers is quick, quick, quick. Uh, and then they'll, they'll get mushy. I mean, they won't get toxic or dangerous. They'll, they'll just get unappealing and mushy. That's why old timers always wouldn't fit in your cellar, right? Yeah, 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 sure. I mean, this, this, the cellar is, 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 is the place to do it, yeah. So, but you know, you can do it at warm temperatures, just you have to understand it's a much, it's a much quicker process. And it, you know, really, for cucumbers in the summer, you can't really think about it as a preservation uh, uh, method. It's a, you know, it's about you know creating a wonderful flavor and, and, and texture. But you really have to get it into the refrigerator if you want to preserve it for any length of time. Sander, I was just going to say, for as many of us as there are in here, and most people don't have my voice. Um, when about Sander, repeat the questions. Apparently, okay. a lot great, of people great, great. are having trouble okay, hearing great. the questions. Okay, so that, that question was, if you didn't figure it out, yeah, it, was about, um, <laughs> it was about pickles. <laughs> it was about, you know, why did my pickles get, uh, uh, get, get soft and mushy? Hello. Hello. Um, so my sister and I, we've been experimenting with fermenting grains. We've been cooking 
cooking gluten-free grains, letting them sit out for a couple days, and they do their thing. Uh, Amaranth has done really well. I'm wondering if that is breaking down the phytic acid like it does if you were to soak the grains and then cook them. Wait, I'm sorry, Miss. I so you, but you, you're you're soaking them. We're cooking them first, and then just letting them sit out for a couple days, and they start fermenting. Um, is that breaking down the phytic acid like it does when you soak the grains and then cook them? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. So the question was about phytic acid and whether, I, I mean, what I would do if I were you is I would soak them, then cook them, and then if you want to let them ferment after the cooking, let them ferment after the cooking if you really want to make sure the phytic acid is gone. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, let, let me just also just say, like, I mean, I've, I, 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 I've learned, uh, you know, a certain amount of the science of all of this, but I have not taken a biology class since ninth grade. I am not a biologist. I am not a microbiologist. I'm not a food scientist. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a clinician. Um, you know, I, I go out on a limb a lot and, uh, and, and try to answer people's questions to the best of my understanding, but, you know, I definitely, um, I, 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 I can't answer that with um, somebody here. Okay. You just said you weren't a clinician, but this is a health question. So if you could just, from your own experience, tell us what it's been for your health. How has it affected your health to eat so many and drink so much Okay. So the, the the question is 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 about how have you know how how have fermented foods um, um, impacted upon my health? And let, let me just say one thing, which is that you know. I don't know how people ever feel sure what it is that makes them feel the way they feel. Um, you know, I can tell you that, like, you know, my life has not been uh, like an experiment where I'm just changing one variable at a time. Um, so, so I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I've, I've gone through. Okay, I mean, let me tell you all that. You know, I've been living with HIV for 21 years. Um, you know, I've had some periods of health crisis. I take antiretroviral drugs that I started taking. You know, I mean, I, I wish I could tell you that my story was, you know, just eating sauerkraut kept me totally healthy <laughs> and, and everything was great. And, you know, and I've met lots of people who are on the kinds of drugs that I'm on who have terrible digestive challenges. Um, and, you know, that they associate with those drugs. And I've never had problems like that. You know, is that because I eat sauerkraut and, um, um, you know, and, 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 and all these other things, I, I can't tell you for sure. Um, you know, I can tell you that sometimes when I'm traveling and I don't have access to eating a lot of culture foods, um, you know, my digestion slows down a little bit, I'm not as regular. Um, so, you know, that, that suggests something, I, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't say for sure. I mean, I, I get a lot of emails with people sharing anecdotal stories with me. Um, and uh, you know, I can tell you that a lot of people experience dramatic improvements in their digestion as a result of incorporating um, you know, these foods into their diets. I've never had huge problems with my digestion, so I can't really say that I had a, like a dramatic um, um, uh, uh, change. Um, you know, mo there, there, there's been a huge amount of research into probiotics. I mean, I consider live culture foods to be probiotic. People in the probiotic industry would disagree with me. Uh, you know, they would say that the only foods that are probiotic are the things where there are clinical trial, clinical trials, sort of establishing you know specific efficacy. And you know, the the the, the, the range of um, you know areas of human health in which efficacy has been established for specific probiotic agents is extraordinary. Um, you know, how much can we extrapolate from that, that like, you know, fermented foods with live cultures give us the same benefit? I, I don't know. There, you know, no, nobody does clinical trials for sauerkraut. Um, you know, because, because nobody owns sauerkraut, and, um, you know, nobody has anything to gain from um, clinical trials for sauerkraut. But there has been some really interesting research, and my, my, my favorite study that I write about in this book um, was performed by a, a team of uh, investigators in Spain. And they, took, they, 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 they got a group of volunteers, people who regularly ate foods with live bacterial cultures, not necessarily sauerkraut, but you know, olives, raw milk cheeses, salami, um, uh, you know, different bacterial foods. 
Um, and then they, 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 they did some um, uh, baseline blood and stool analysis looking at different markers of immune functioning. Then they put the people on a deprivation diet where they couldn't eat any of their favorite ferments. And um, you know, as predicted, um, you know, everybody's um, uh, you know, measures of those immune indicators was suppressed as a result of not eating the bacterially rich foods. Um, then they put half the group on yogurt and half the group on a probiotic yogurt. And both groups regained a portion of the immune function that they had lost, about equivalent amounts of function, but neither of them regained full functioning until they were allowed to go back on their old diets of eating varied live culture bacterial foods. So, um, you know, I, I mean, we're, we really have only the you know, crudest understanding of, you know, how bacteria help to regulate our health and what happens when we eat bacteria. Um, you know, in the probiotics industry, there's all this like, uh, uh, you know, marketing hype about, um, you know, enteric coating on the pills and, and, you know, what bacteria can survive um, gastric transit you know, through the stomach. Well, food buffers the bacteria, so it's not really an issue with food. It's really well established that, you know, the bacteria you eat in food, like, you know, it, like it comes out the other end, it survives gastric transit. You know, the bigger question is, you know, whether the bacteria we eat actually take up residence um, in our gut, which is, you know, uh, you know in, a, in a healthy person, you know, every ecological niche of your gut is already populated. And it's not like, you know, they're just going to move over and you know, make room <laughs> for the sauerkraut bacteria to take over. But, um, you know, I, I mean, the, the bacteria are, are, are so interesting. And, uh, you know, the bacteria have fluid genetics. Like, they don't have fixed genes the way we do. Um, um, you know, one you know, beautiful essay by, by a team of microbiologists that I read, um, you know, basically likened genes for bacteria to the way human beings use tools. So, you know, you don't have to carry around a jackhammer all the time. You know, when you have need to, you know, bust up, a, you know, a, a, a concrete sidewalk, you know, you, you go rent a jackhammer and, and you jackhammer. You know, when you need a hammer to nail something in, you go pick up a hammer and hammer it. When you need a knife, you pick up a knife and you cut something. Um, so, you know, the basic idea is that, that you know, bacteria, when, when they face, um, you know, sort of uh, a nutrient that they're not able to metabolize, if they can find the genes in their environment that will enable them to do this, they take up those genes. So one of the possible models for how it works is that when we're eating these live bacterial foods, the bacteria themselves are not necessarily taking up residence in us, but they are they are basically contributing to the overall environment of genes available to the bacteria in our gut. So they're actually, um, you know, diversifying and replenishing genetics rather than organisms. And this whole idea of species, you know, probiotics is sort of predicated on the idea that there are specific species that are especially beneficial to us. But, you know, the, the cutting edge of microbiology, they're acknowledging that species do not exist in bacteria. There is, there is bacteria, and they, you know, have access to, to varied genetics depending, you know, upon the, the metabolic needs and, and, uh, and, and, and whatever. So, so I don't know, you know, we have this very crude uh, uh, understanding. Nobody really knows exactly how they work. There's a lot of, you know, there, there's a lot of, um, uh, Hype, I would say. You know, um, you know, I'm I'm not seeing these wonderful people make uh, you know make make any ridiculous claims. But I mean, I have seen on websites, you know, people kombucha websites telling diabetics to drink kombucha that is going to cure diabetes. I mean, personally, you know, someone who's been living with a you know notorious disease that everyone wants to claim they have the cure for, you know, I'm really suspicious of people with, with miracle cures and. And you know, sauerkraut contains these compounds called isothiocyanates that are anti-carcinogenic. Does that mean if you're diagnosed with a brain tumor, you just have to eat two pounds of sauerkraut a day and your tumor is gonna shrink away to nothing? I mean, I'm, I'm skeptical about that. On the other hand, 
you know, it, it may be perfectly plausible that by incorporating that this food into your into your life on a regular basis, you could be less likely to develop a tumor in the first place. Um, so, you know, as for like, you know, the 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 you know healing applications of this food, you know. I mean, I would say that you know it has the potential to improve anybody's digestion and assimilation of nutrients. Um, you know, and because um, you know bacteria in our gut play such an important role in mediating immune function, it, it, it may um, you know help um, to um, you know stimulate anyone's immunity. But you know, so will rolling around in the dirt. Um, you know, I mean, it seems like I mean, a lot of the I mean a lot of the. Um, Health crises that we're having essentially amount to underexposure to varied bacteria. Um, so you know, no one food offers the answer, but you know, eating more widely and eating different types of food that contain different uh, bacterial populations, um, you know, diversity is its own reward. Um, so, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the best I can do. Hi. Um, so when I this is about a detoxification. When I started drinking kombucha, I experienced something that was described to me as a, a healing crisis. Um, I got a little carried away with it and was drinking it a lot. <coughs> and my question to you is, in your experience, is this common? Um, and with other fermented foods, is this uh, um, a side effect when you, when you incorporate these things more into your diet? I, I've heard stories about that. So the question is about like she incorporated a lot of kombucha into her uh, diet. She she had some problems that were described as a healing crisis. I presume that you moved it was like through flu like them. symptoms. Well, I mean, one thing I would say that I would recommend that people not start eating or drinking large amounts <laughs> of, of bacterial food right off the bat. You know, start with small portions, you know, a little bit of, you know, the, the thing about bacteria is there's like, you know, there, there's billions of cells in every, you know, there, there's, no, there's no specific virtue in, you know, consuming huge amounts of any of these live bacterial foods. It's more about regularity, just, just, just you know, having them, you know, enter our bodies um, uh, frequently, not necessarily in, in huge amounts. So, I mean, the first thing I would recommend for anyone is to, you know, introduce these foods slowly. Um, and, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with having large amounts of them, but I would say work your way up to it slowly. Um, actually, here, I'm going to just talk about my, my friend here. I'm, wear, I'm wearing this t-shirt that's a memorial to, uh, to, to Frank Cook, who is um, uh, a friend who died a few years ago, who uh, was a, a plant teacher, and he, he and I taught together uh, quite a few times. But one, one, one of the first times we taught um, was at Earth Haven Eco Village. Um, and in the space where we were teaching at, at Earth Haven, um, somebody was like obsessed with kombucha. Um, and there were like, you know, a hundred gallon jars arrayed around this room with, you know, different flavors of kombucha. And, you know, it was hot, it was summertime, we were thirsty, we drank a lot of kombucha. Um, after two days of the workshop, um, uh, uh, Frank started having this pain and he ended up passing kidney stones. Um, and, you know, without any specific medical verification, uh, you know, his, his feeling about it was that, that, like, you know, drinking gallons of kombucha was somehow related to his passing of the kidney stones. Um, so, you know, maybe an instructive tale. Um, you know, there's really, like, there, there's no reason to go whole hog. There's no, you know, like, these, these you know, th these foods in general have been, you know, used in, 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 in small portions. They're powerful. Like, you don't need huge amounts of them. And so it's not necessarily uncommon for, you know, someone having them for the first time to, you know, go through some changes in relation to them. But I'd say they'd be less dramatic if you do them in small doses. Can you talk about the white mold? I, your <clears throat> book, Wild Fermentation, fell in my hands like two months ago. I went and nuts and fermented everything to get my hands on, and there was so much white mold, which I yeah, read and heard. You just skim it off, but every day it was just such a It's big hot. Thing. It's hot. This really is not the ideal weather for, um, for fermenting. You will get white mold when it's this hot. White mold is benign. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, for years I, I kept waiting for somebody to sort of say, well, 
you know, I have this friend with extreme mycosensitivities, and I served them the sauerkraut that I had scraped the mold off of, and, and they got sick from it. But I mean, I just still have never heard a single story like that. I mean, it's really, it, it's really been on. In a lot of traditions, they don't skim the mold off; they mix the mold back in. Um, and in some situations, I, 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 I have, I have come to do that. Um, if you want to not have mold, wait until October. Um, and uh, you know, and then you have the possibility of fermenting with, without, uh, you know, with, without things getting really moldy. So. But in this kind of heat, um, I, I mean, heat makes things mold faster. Uh, higher salt levels will slow down the molds. Spices will slow down the molds, or engineered crocks that don't allow for air access. You can't get molds like that if there's no oxygen. So that's what these like you know um, uh, uh, German crocs that have a they, they have like a little V around them that you fill with water and then you put the lid in that and that creates an airlock so that you get little burps coming out um, uh, but you don't get a, a fresh flow of air going in. People are also fermenting uh, in jars with. Um, uh, with a plastic lid and a hole drilled in it and a little rubber gasket and, and an airlock, and that's another strategy. I don't do any of those because I'm obsessed with smelling and touching and tasting my, my crowd frequently, and if you have an engineered solution like that, it's, you know, it's all based on the idea that you're not gonna open it until some target date when it's ready, and I just like to, I like to keep mine from you know, day two, um, you know, I just, I just like to keep on tasting it. And so when I've had those kinds of crocs, I, I, just, I just defeat the purpose of them and end up with molds in them anyway. But I don't worry about the surface mold. I mean, it really, uh, for some, some people it, it, it freaks them out and I, I'm just not worried about it. But you do skim it. Yeah, yeah, I, I generally skim it. I don't know, I, okay, sometimes I make, make this, you know, I, I've gotten into making some of the vegetable ferments as liquids, so beet kvass is one of the classic yeah, ones. Yeah, a lot of mold in that, and it's kind of hard on a liquid to skim skim the mold off. So I just shake it up, it turns <laughs> more, it makes it more pink. Oh, here I'm, I'm in, I'm in this guy in the front. Then I'll. I'll... Uh, I, I've made a couple of batches of kimchi, and I'm satisfied with the taste of it, but I don't get the effervescent quality. That well, I mean, I'll tell you, um, um, the, the, the kimchi that I describe in wild fermentation, I've gotten a fair amount of um, feedback through the years that, that while it, it, it tastes great, it's not really like, like the kimchi that people buy in the stores. Um, in this book, I have a section on kimchi. I can tell you a couple of things. One of the things is um, for the ferment to be really bubbly, you can't let it go for a long time. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 the bacterial populations in, ferment, in, in fermented vegetables specifically, it, it's a successional pro process. So you, you start with, with certain bacteria, the pH changes, then other bacteria develop. You know, really, now I think of this as shape-shifting among the, you know, it's the same bacteria, but they're, you know, as their environment is changing, their, their genetics are, 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 are shifting. Um, but, but, but anyway, um, the early stage bacteria produce a lot of carbon dioxide. The later stage bacteria do not. So, so generally, like to get to get the effervescence, you really just um, uh, those those are um, uh, summer kimchi, and those are fermented for a very short period of time, just a few days. A couple of other things is that you know most kimchi is made with sort of a rice gruel where you, 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 you use either rice or rice flour and make this thin, um, it's like sort of like wheat paste, just a thin gruel of it. And then you mix your spices in with that, and, and that also helps it get more effervescent. And if you use um, the Korean powdered uh, uh, chili peppers in that rice gruel, that's how you get the red brine that uh, is characteristic of the um, Korean kimchi. So that, that's a, a, a few of the you know um, um, techniques that make kimchi distinctive from uh, sauerkraut. Okay, the person who thought. Uh, okay, great. Um, curious, is there anywhere in town where you can buy good crocs? 
Anywhere in town where you can buy good crops, or is there any stores in town? Anywhere in town where you can buy good Antique crops? Ace. 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 Barn. Okay, let me say a couple things about, about, about some of these things. Antique stores, one thing you just want to make sure of with old crops is that they don't, they don't have lead glazes. And if you, you, if you can pick up a, a lead testing kit, uh, you can easily determine uh, whether or not they have lead glazes. Um, Ace Hardware has this great deal where, I mean, I don't know if they carry them in the store, but if you order them on the website, there's free shipping to any Ace store. The other thing is, you know, increasingly, I have been using handmade crocs made by artisan potters. So, you know, if you have the money to sort of, you know, support a local craftsperson, um, you know, I'm sure in Ash, you know, in, in, in this very talented town, there are people making beautiful handcrafted crocs. Um, so, you know, you have, you have a few different options. So you already said one thing. If they mold it, get new. Get, find find someone else who can give you a healthier kombucha mold. Well, see, I, I talked to somebody about that, and they suggested that it might not be kombucha, but another smoothie called Jun. Do you know anything about that? Um, sure, I know a little bit about Jun. Uh, uh, Jun is. Um, John is, let's, let's call it a cousin of kombucha that's generally made with honey rather than sugar. Um, you know, I have, I, you know, and, uh, as far as I can tell, John originated in Eugene, Oregon, although the people in Eugene, Oregon say that it came from Tibet. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the literature that exists on Himalayan fermentation makes no mention of it. The you know, couple of Tibetan people that I've gotten to talk to about fermentation have never heard of it. So, you know, I've come to the personal conclusion that it is, uh, um, uh, that it is like a, 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 a diversion of the family tree of kombucha that has been able to adapt to honey. I mean, I hear, for, I hear very conflicting things, uh, you know, from my emails about kombucha. So the conventional wisdom about kombucha is you need to have tea and sugar. Um, but then I hear from people who make it on apple juice, or people who make it on herbal teas, or on honey. And then I hear from other people who, who tried it on honey and had their kombucha mother shrivel up and die. So just like, okay, here, we're all the same species, right? So you could take the group of us and take us to some, you know, extreme environment where we have, you know, just some, um, you know, marginal nutrition available to us. And you know, some of us would die faster than others. Some of us could probably adapt to a very different environment. So, you know, my my general idea is that you know some kombuchas are able to adapt to different kinds of environments and different kinds of nutrients, and others are not. Um, and um, you know, so my basic understand, my, you know, my, my basic idea is that John is kombucha that has successfully adapted to honey. Um, and I, I've worked a little bit with 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 John. I mean, it looks just like kombucha. Um, you know, it, it, it's maybe more functional at cooler temperatures than kombucha is. Um, you know, it's got a, a, a few distinctions, but 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 they're distinctions that really could just be you know d d diversions of, of the family tree. But I would say that um, you know if, if your kombucha has consistently uh, uh, been molding, I, I would really just try to get a hold of a of, of, of a different mother. Um, and also, like one of the ways to make sure your kombucha doesn't mold is to make sure that you put in enough mature kombucha to create an acidic environment because the acidity is really what's going to um, uh, discourage, inhibit the molding. On that, is it also important to have I mean, I don't think it necessarily has to be a cheesecloth. I don't usually or use a cheesecloth, but a thin cloth. Like I wouldn't put it, yeah, oh yeah, it's definitely, a need, it needs to breathe. It, it's aerobic. And it's a little bit of an oxymoron to talk about aerobic ferments because like for biologists, what defines fermentation is that it's anaerobic metabolism. 
Um, but you know, in the on the ground world of you know people and the foods and beverages we drink, there are a lot of examples of you know microbial foods that need um, oxygen. Kombucha is one of them. Vinegar is one of them. Tempeh is one of them. Um, so you know, just cer certain foods um, that we call ferments uh, uh, you know, need oxygen. And so yeah, kombucha needs to breathe. Um, but you know, it doesn't need cheesecloth to breathe. You, know, you could use a thin. Uh, what I usually use is like a thin kitchen towel or, or sheets. I'm, I'm, I'm really into you know, taking my old sheets and, and using them as, as crop covers. I have a different question. Were you in a Sun Magazine article a few years back? Yes. And did you, I'm trying to remember, was there like a part of that where there was some kind of cooperative school environment that you described? Um, well, I mean, it might be uh, uh, about the, the place where, where, uh, where I live. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, there was like some classes that went on. Well, I, I mean, I have a little fermentation. So I live in Tennessee, about four and a half hours from here, southeast of Nashville. And I, I teach classes there on my website, wildfermentation.com. You can find out about, about the classes that, that I teach. Uh, mostly multi-day kind of intensive uh, workshops where we do lots of different things and, and, and they're very hands-on. Um, so yeah, I've talked about my workshop, to, 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 to talk about where I live, things like that. Hi, yeah. Liberty. Hey, um, so I guess there's a little way that possibly very hard, but um, I mean, if you haven't, could you speak a little bit to the political climate and how that affects um, fermentation Yeah, sure. Let me. Um, uh, so, so, so the question is about the um, um, you know uh, salmonella outbreak that occurred in relation to Tempe, not only in Asheville but in some other places that was traced to um, uh, one source of Tempe starter in Rockville, Maryland. They closed their doors very quickly. Um, Well, okay, so 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 tempe is 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 a little bit unusual among fermented foods because most of the fermented foods are acidic, so they would not be vulnerable to um, you know salmonella or or, or other um, uh, uh, food poisoning. So you know something like you know sauerkraut, you, you just couldn't have something like that uh, happen. Kombucha, you couldn't have something like that. Um, uh, happen. So with, with, with the majority of fermented foods, the acidification itself is what protects the food. And, um, you know, there's, there, there, there's really no, there's no reason to, to, to pasteurize the, the, those foods. Um, with tempeh, I mean, what, what's interesting about the, the, the case for me is like, you know, there are so many foods where it's just presumed that salmonella is part of them. I mean, you know, we, when you buy eggs at the supermarket, when you buy, you know, ground beef at the supermarket, you just presume that they have salmonella in them, and you just cook them thoroughly, and, um, and, and you know, that, that destroys the problem. I mean, you know, we just, we, these are foods that we cook, um, uh, you know, because of, I mean, maybe you'd cook them even if it wasn't for salmonella, but, but because of salmonella, people are, you know, sort of conscious of, of cooking these foods thoroughly. There is no tradition of eating tempeh raw. Um, you know, in, in, in Indonesia, tempeh is always cut into tiny pieces and cooked well. So, um, you know, even if there were salmonella in it, it wouldn't be, you know, an issue. Um, you know, as for the, 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 the pre-pasteurization of, of tempeh, I mean, that's mostly done for reasons of shelf stability, which is, which is why pasteurization is usually done for um, uh, you know, for, for shelf, shelf stability rather than for um, you know, safety issues per, per se. So, 